Welcome back to another Dojo Game Review, and today I'm going to talk about a very common, very common problem that people have when they first start annotating their games. And this is shown by just the process that me and Sombrero had um, in getting this game out to you. So, he first sent me a very abbreviated annotation. And I yelled at him like an angry schoolmaster. And I said, no, Sombrero, give me more. Well, he gave me a little bit more, and then I yelled at him again. And it made me a little bit uncomfortable because I don't like to be the angry schoolmaster. But the point that I was trying to make, and I do believe we definitely got more out of him, is to recognize that, and I see this in so many people, both my students and then also people who've just written to me about trying to follow my uh, path to improvement, which is based on analyzing your games, that the first time, this is what everybody says, the first time they try to do this, they come up with just a couple notes, a couple ideas about like where they might have improved. And um, it's hard for them to see both where the questions might lie in the position and then also how to talk about a position in words. And in a way, really what you're doing is you're gaining liter literally literacy, chess literacy, and able to talk about the variations, put some uh, evaluations on them, and talk about the dynamics in words. And it's hard. And a lot of times, most of the time, in fact, I'm gonna say more than 90% of the time, uh, people fail. And that's actually the problem of my improvement program is that it's so prone to failure, right? It is the path forward, but it is very prone to failure because so many people reach that first little questions and they're like, I'm done. I don't know what to do. So we're going to talk a little bit about this game and how to use it as an example of how to analyze your games. And I just want to stress the experience he had of submitting a game and it being very short in analysis is very common, and very common for somebody who's just doing it as a new thing. It takes some time. Okay, so here we go. Um, this form of development, popularized by friend of the dojo, Eugene Perlstein, I like it a lot. You can also use it against the smith Moore Gambit, same thing. And it prevents, presents white a question. You wanna play e5 or takes, uh, Sombrero second guesses himself as a chessable course that says e5. Both are fine moves, and both give totally different uh, natures to them, right? One with an isolated queen pawn, one with a French structure. Uh, personally, I like this for white quite a bit, and I think a lot of Sombrero's problems actually come with understanding how the dynamic of the isolated queen pawn works. And that, I think, has a lot to do. You can learn that dynamic by going over your games as well as classic games, but mostly your own games. So here we go. I like everything up to now that he did, up to this point. And um, let's talk a little bit about the isolated queen pawn. The point of the isolated queen pawn, the advantage, is that you're the person with a big fatty in the center of the board. And that central control hopefully will result, what you're aiming for is that it will restrict one or more of the black miners and sometimes the queen, right? To make one or more of those pieces bad. And in those pieces being nasty, sometimes you can then develop an attack based on their own misplacement or feeling of discomfort. Okay. So, uh, I felt that castles was the correct move here, and let's talk about queen b3. Queen b3 feels funky to me because the queen can get smacked by either bishop e6 or a later knight c6, a5. Um, Sombrero doesn't talk about knight takes c3 here, but I feel like that is totally playable for black too, this kind of position, knight a5 uh, ideas as well as e5 ideas unclear that the queen belongs on b3. And what we're gonna see in this, beginning in this position, is that Sombrero uh, starts to swim. That's a Russian word or concept where somebody just loses their way in a position. Uh, 
And a lot of times, you know, you'll just continue losing the way until you hit some kind of rock bottom, after which you're either lost or you're not. Um, so, um, for example, Castle's Knight C6, Sombrero only thinks about this move and this, right, where you're moving the developed piece twice, and this is my variation here with Rook E1. Um, for the most part, all of these moves are his moves. I've added a couple. Now, what is the dynamic? What is the problem for black? That's one of the key things you want to focus on when you've got an isolated queen pawn. What is the problem? Because usually there is one. It looks on the surface that he's doing great, right? All of his pieces kind of make sense. However, it's not immediately clear where the bishop on c8 is supposed to go. Uh, and so, for example, if bishop g4, h3 is a problem. Now, does this mean he's lost or anything? No, it just means he's got a problem and rook e1 is a good move. Could he play knight takes c3? Yes, but then what we can do is we can contrast that with the position with queen b3 and we say, oh, on queen b3, I'm gonna get smacked. With rook e1, I'm kind of sort of doing something. So maybe there's a different building move besides rook e1, but the main thing I want to, to say as a dynamic is like, oh, we, we don't have much or anything, but now at least the bishop on c8 has real questions about what it's doing in life. On e6, and gets smacked with knight g5, if bishop f5 doesn't really know quite yet what it's doing there. It wants to pressure the center, right? Okay, so queen b3, <clears throat> knight b6. I think knight takes c3, also a good move. a4, and um, Sombrero writes about bishop b3. Okay, the thing I want you to see about a4, though, is that he's swimming. He doesn't know what to do, so he's going to lash out at black. And black does this, bishop b6. Let's say that's correct, queen d1. And one of the questions I wanted Sombrero to ask is, well, should black allow a5? Personally, I don't think he should. I think the knight's pretty good here. It controls both of these squares, you know. And with a5, we would be getting control over a square like b4, which could be used for our queen or our knight. And both those are useful things for black, right? So he started, and he's starting to really carve out some nice uh, squares here for himself on the queen side. So that was one of the questions I thought should be asked. Uh, here you could play it on this move as well. Okay, so knight c6, a5, okay. a6, okay. And um, the knight on c6, a little tender now, right? And the knight on d5, this is an important point. It's you know, it's technically blockading d5, but it's not actually controlling d5 from where it is, right? So, and it's also in the way of the queen. So if I have my choice, I think I would rather have the knight on b6, right? So that's a, um, a win for the pawn going to a6, and maybe he could consider even taking it on a6. But that would be an achievement for white, for sure. Okay, so castles, knight c7, kinda weird. Kind of weird, right? Um, in the way of the C file. And now you analyze bishop f4, good. And bishop b3, what you did. Seems okay. And here's where we want to talk about swimming again. So again, when we analyze our games, we want to come to an understanding of the dynamics of the position. And when people swim in games when they're just kind of making moves because they don't know what else to do. It's because they haven't been able to put into words what the variations are, what, I mean, what the dynamics of the position are, right? So for me, isolate queen pawn, well, the, first of all, the classic things when you say you don't know what, what the plan is, well, we want to control this square, the blockade square, and we want to control the squares around it. Classic isolate queen pawn stuff. And now this square, is also kind of tenver, and this knight is weird. So now we talk about the isolated queen pawn. We want to talk about which of our opponent's pieces are weird. Well, now both of those knights are a little funky. So yeah, default move, I guess, is queen a4, rook fd1. I like your position. I think you're doing all right. 
So Queen C1. Here at the dojo, Costa made a nice joke where he said you should construct a opening repertoire where Bishop H6 is a mistake because so many people do it. And that's what, notice, Sombrero is defaulting to uh, because he doesn't know what else to do. And my rule of thumb about Bishop H6 is don't do it unless you're mating the guy, right? Or unless you have prospects to mate the guy. Otherwise, you're wasting way too much time and energy doing it. Also, in the position with an isolated queen pawn, in general, you are not interested in any kind of trades because the isolated queen pawn is giving you space, right? And with that space, you want to keep him cramped. Keep him with dirty pieces like knight c7, right? Okay, so queen c1, knight a5, good move. Rook a3, and now a mistake on both a positional and tactical level. First, we'll look at the tactical reason why. d5 cutting the bishop, and now black found nothing better than snip, snop, snip, and I think white is uh, doing great. Let's put that, put, put it there, and we'll come back to this in a second. The positional reason this is wrong is really he's playing with his pretty pieces instead of fixing his knight, um, and I think, I think he's dreaming about winning the pawn, which should be uh, furthest from his mind, right? What should he do? Sombrero says it. Rook a c8. Okay. Um, it'd be nice to have some variations to try to get a sense, you know, gain a sense of just how bad it is, if it's if it is all that bad, right? Okay, so let's look at the game, and then I'll have a couple closing thoughts here. Uh, two pieces, a beautiful thing, and this is a nice resource, and that's even a better one. Beautiful. And now a standard mistake that happens when you put people under pressure. Queen e8, thank you very much. Game over. Okay, so one of the features of this game that I really want to stress is I've seen it all the time as a chess teacher that it is very difficult the first time around to uh, do an annotation of your games. And my most common experience as a teacher is that people give up. Also, as someone who's done it myself, I know there have been times in my life when I have failed to do it simply because it is a hard project and requires a lot of emotional energy just to deal with all of my terrible moves, right? And, you know, it takes energy to, you know, sit down and talk about what you see is happening in the position. And, you know, not to just look at what the computer says. Because the computer will tell you some cool things, but it's not going to be able to put into words what the dynamics in the position are. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed it. Till next time on Dojo Game Review.